welcome to Scoobs on this uh, rather chilly Wednesday evening, I believe. Um, anybody here who's never been to Scoobs before? Yes. Friends in here? Ah, welcome, welcome. Oh, you don't count and you don't count. No. <laughs> welcome, thanks very much for coming, guys. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our author and our MC for the evening. And I'm sure a lot of you will uh, recognize David O'Sullivan. Really? Yes, I'm sure you do. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> I've got a quick bio for you. David is an award-winning radio and TV journalist who has been in the business for more than 30 years. He's worked as a foreign correspondent for numerous international radio networks, including Voice of America and Independent Radio News in London. In 1991, he embarked on a career in law, joining the media law department at Weber Wenzel. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't a good idea. He joined 702 in 1995 and stayed for the next 20 years. He also consults for corporates on media training and strategy, facilitates conferences, is a public speaker and MC, as well as producing and presenting podcasts. You can currently hear David on Kaya FM's Breakfast with David show on from a Monday to a Thursday. Is that correct? Okay. Welcome, David. Thank you very much for being here tonight. And the lady of the hour, um, Ms. Mandy Wiener, is one of South Africa's best known and most credible journal journalists and authors. She worked as a multi-award winning reporter for Eyewitness News from 2004 to 2014 and is currently a freelancer. Ministry of Crime is her fourth book, following on from the best-selling Killing Kebel. We sold 182 copies. Well yeah. And my second initiation, a memoir of Lucy Piccoli. Uh, she also wrote Behind the Door, the Oscar Pistorius and Riva Stienkamp story. We sold 82. <laughs> <laughs> which she co-ordered with Barry Bateman. And we're happy to say that she lives and works in Johannesburg. So welcome, Mandy. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. And I'm going to hold you hand over to David. Thank you. And I believe Killing Kebbell sold 100,000 copies overall. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, that's what we were told the last time. Um, let's start with something that's actually quite current at the moment, which isn't in the book, but it relates to stuff in the book. And that is that um, just recently, in fact yesterday, uh, or the day before, the police commissioner and the police minister announced a new campaign to crack down on crime. Now, we've heard many of these campaigns before, and they're easy to, quite, uh, to just dismiss out of hand because very little ultimately changes. But I think that because we've got a new minister and a new police commissioner, that possibly I'm going to look a little bit more in depth, a little more closely at what they're saying. One of the things I asked General Kekle Satole about the new commissioner um, when I interviewed him yesterday was, what have you done about crime intelligence? Now, we know that he's appointed a new head of crime intelligence, but I asked him particularly, what was he going to do to reconstitute, to build up crime intelligence, which had been eviscerated, is the word I think we will use for this occasion, by the criminal underworld, and that is something that you do address quite in depth in the book. So let's talk about crime intelligence and the importance of having a good crime intelligence unit. Thanks, David. Yeah, so crime intelligence is absolutely crucial to combating organized crime. Uh, and I stress this point in the book because uh, it's all good and well to go after the, the grassroots criminal and the button men, as they call them, but you really want the kingpins. That's the only way to, to break organized crime and, and the syndicates. Um, and that's been a real problem. And, and as you say, crime intelligence has been eviscerated. It's been hollowed out over the last decade or so, largely because of the infighting that's been going on and because of the, the non-leadership of, of Richard and Bluey, who became this kind of bogeyman in South Africa. And, and, and there was looting, and they were paying family members who they supposedly had employed as intelligence agents 
um, and they were buying cars for themselves with kickbacks and renting out their own homes and safe houses and, and pocketing the rent. So all of this was going on and they were busy spying on each other, not doing any real intelligence work, which is why we're at the point where we are with cash and transit heights at the moment, because all of that infiltrating of networks and getting people um, you know, kind of incognito into these organizations, that just didn't happen, which is why we're, we're now feeling the results of that. So um, Kiko Satona has appointed this new crime intelligence head, Peter Jacobs. And it's the first time that we've had a permanent head of crime intelligence in the country for, for nearly a decade. Um, during Richard and Ludi's time, he was on suspension for eight years and earned 12 million rand while sitting at home, including a performance bonus. So Peter Jacobs is there now. He's a career cop as well. He's got a history as, uh, as an intelligence operative. Um, all the crime intelligence people I've spoken to say, by all accounts, he's, he's a good guy and he's bringing some kind of stability back because without that intelligence, there's no way that we'll ever be able to, to, to get the better of, of any of these syndicates or any of these organized crime networks. And, and the, cash and the, the, the cash and transit stuff is all intelligence based. The only way that you're gonna stop these cross pavement things and, and you know, it's so well planned and so well orchestrated that you have to have intelligence if you wanna get them before they carry it out. Just picking up on that, um, we see as well a lot of police officers are involved in the cash and transit heist. And uh, Satoli was saying that he was not happy with the cooperation he gets from the cash and transit companies. But in the book, you, you write about Richard and Lulia, you write about the police officers who were on the take and how easy it was for the criminals like Rutherford Kreitcher and others to be handing out brown envelopes to what extent should I understand that this police force wasn't there to protect and to serve, but was there because of nefarious purposes? So to respond to the, the first part of the, of the question is that the reason he's not getting cooperation from the cash and transit companies is because for the past decade, the cash and transit companies wouldn't hand over information to the police because they knew that they were handing it over to a compromised police service and it would be to their detriment. So if they had intelligence on who was responsible for these CRTs, there's no way that they're going to be giving it to the guys who they believe are responsible for carrying out the CRTs. So there's no cooperation going on whatsoever between the, um, the, the, the cash transit companies and the police service, and that needs to change. Um, but that, of course, means that there needs to be confidence in the police. Um, and the police are compromised to such a great extent. And that's because invariably, every single cash house that happens, and not just cash house, any, any kind of organized crime syndicate has got police officers involved. I did an interview with uh, Prince Mokateli, who's the head of the Hawks in Gauteng, and he says that every time they break a syndicate, there's usually three or four cops that are involved. So these are working cops who are involved in the organized crime syndicate. So you've got the guys who are supposed to be fighting crime who are actually committing the crime. Um, and if you look at the Kreitcher story, that's the, the most obvious example where he was able to corrupt the police from station level. So the guys who are on patrol in Bedford View would come into money points and he'd give them a wad of cash and say, go get some KFC for lunch, um, to the generals. Um, who were given bags of cash, literally. Um, and there were accusations that he was paying off the head detective in the country who was investigating him and the head of crime intelligence in the country. So it's at every single level, level that the police have been infiltrated. Um, and, and you just can't have that. But unfortunately, you know, th there's always that fine line between uh, police and organized crime. And it's very opaque. And you'll see time and time again where you've got the good guys working for the bad guys and the bad guys working for the good guys. So most of the, the main kingpins in the underworld are police sources. So they are agents for the police. So the police pay them for information and they inform on their competitors in the industry. Um, but that then means that they're protected from prosecution. So somebody like Cyril Birker, for example, was an underworld kingpin but he was a state security agent. 
So he would collect information, but he was still pretty much a bad guy, but he would never get prosecuted because he was working for the state. Um, and then you look at somebody like Captain KGB, Morris Shabalala, who is an armed robber. He's a cash and transit heister. And he was a crime intelligence officer, even though he had been convicted. And the cops let him come back to crime intelligence after being convicted. So there's always this kind of gray, opaque area between good and evil. In the, in the case of Morris Shabalala, wasn't he able to try and explain himself when they caught him as uh, you know, perpetrating crime? He said, well, in order to keep my cover, I had to do their, their bidding. I had to be involved. I had to actually commit the crime. Otherwise, I would have blown my cover and I wouldn't be providing this valuable intelligence. So I'm wondering to what extent he actually was a useful source. Did any information from uh, Captain KGB himself, Morris Shabalala, ever result in the prosecution of anybody involved in cash and transit heist? Did he ever bring down a gang? Because he says, that's why I was acting like a criminal. So, so there is legislation that permits for crime intelligence officers, for, for law enforcement officers, to get clearance before they do these operations, which he did not get. So after the, the big um, heist at Oatambo Airport last year, or the year before, which it was believed that he was involved in, after being released from prison for a previous cash heist, um, he was supposedly involved in that, and then there was this mad scramble at crime intelligence to try and give him the clearance that he needed so that he could say that he was working for crime intelligence, even though he would have had to get that before the crime was actually committed. Um, you know, he says that he was busy with all these operations, but it's very hard to quantify. You can't tell, unfortunately, because of the clandestine nature of, of what we're dealing with. Um, but when I heard that he had been uh, allowed back into crime intelligence, I sent then Khomoto Pakhlani, who was the acting national commissioner, I sent his office a query saying, hi, I've heard that Captain KGB is back at the police, can you please confirm? And they flat denied it. They said it's not true. And then two months later, I sent another query saying, hi, I know he's back again. And they said, no, definitely not true. And a couple of months later, he was arrested. And it turned out in court that he had been there for, for a year or something. So they flat out lied to me in black and white. You know, they're never going to say that, oh, yeah, well, the armed robber is working for us. And, and the minister said um, last week that 27 members of crime intelligence uh, have got criminal records, which is a pretty impressive record. <laughs> and after you read Ministry of Crime, it doesn't surprise you that that number is the case. I'm just delighted that the police commissioner knows that this is the case and that these people are now being investigated. As I started doing a run of interviews with Mandy about this, it felt like this was an, a never-ending spiral of, of, of destruction of our police service. So I'm feeling a little bit more buoyant about it. We've, we've spoken about two characters there, uh, Captain KGB. Uh, but Richard and Bluey, just mop up Richard and Bluey for us. A, a man who was incredibly compromised and then on suspension for such a long time. What's going on there? He's, does he face any criminal charges? Is there any action that's going to be taken against him? He's out of the police mercifully, but is he ever going to see a courtroom? So he's, he's actually currently in court at the moment on this uh, murder charge, this 1990 year old, uh, 1999 murder of Opara Mohibe, who was his ex-girlfriend's husband, who he allegedly killed. But he's not been charged with murder, he's been charged with kidnapping and attempted murder. And we're waiting for a, a judgment on that. But the big issue is this, um, this case of, of corruption and fraud uh, that Glynis Breitenbach was prosecuting against him. And we all know what happened there. I mean, he had massive political protection. Breitenbach tried to, to prosecute. Um, this cabal at the NPA stepped in and protected him, and Glynis lost her job as a result. And for some unknown reason, he's just never been prosecuted. And, and you speak to Glynis, and she says that there's a prima facie case, there's, you know, there's no doubt that, um, that he was guilty on those charges, and yet he's just never been prosecuted. Uh, Fakile and Balula did do uh, one good thing when he was Minister of Police, and that was get rid of Mbouli, so that we can get some stability. Um, but all he actually did was move his retirement forward. So he just got a bigger payout. So he would have gone anywhere. As it stands though, he's got no criminal record. 
And there were always stories that he was still running crime intelligence from a safe house in Boxburg, and that he was working for state security, and he was still really running the show. And there was a, a period of time when, as journalists, we used to phone sources and greet and gloody first, because we were sure that he would be listening to, to all of our phone calls. Um, and you'd go into meetings and have to take out your battery out of your phone and leave it in the car. And people were, were terrified. They were absolutely paranoid because there was so much uh, spying going on. Um, but you know, by all accounts, he's out of it now. I tried to speak to him for the book. Um, as I went to court uh, just before the book went to print. And I waited for him outside the bathrooms because that's what you do. And he came out and um, I had a chat to him and he said he had, he had to do the interview. And then he just never got back to me. So we never actually got to hear from him and what his story is. I'm going to ask you about two characters now, and then I'm going to go get one of the largest beers, because it'll take you the length of time for me to drink the beer to tell these stories. But the story of Rudderbutt Crouch is a character that looms large in the book, as well as that of Lolly Jackson, uh, the, uh, the man who ran the strip clubs and was murdered. And the story about that murder and the, vari the variations on the story of who actually did it is absolutely riveting. But Radovan Krejci is, and he's involved in the saga as well. So I'm going to get Mandy now to weave the two together for you. Um, but also, I think start, Mandy, with who the hell is this guy? Uh, he comes from the Czech Republic. Uh, he's a, a notorious figure when he arrives in South Africa, yet he's able to fashion out a business for himself, ingratiate himself to all sorts of people, and run um, an almost hiding plain sight as he carries on his criminal network. How did that all happen? So, Radovan Krejci really was a big name in the Czech Republic. It wasn't like he arrived here and he was this complete unknown, like non-entity. Um, and he had perfected the art of state capture in the Czech Republic already where he had funded an entire political party that had come into power, and he was supposed to get a, a state petroleum company in, in exchange. So and that was pretty much state capture at its best. Um, and he then landed on the wrong side of, of politics in the Czech Republic, and the police started investigating him, um, and he allegedly killed somebody in a vat of acid, and there were all these crazy stories about him. Um, and the, the cops were raiding his, his villa in, in just outside Prague, and he literally walked out the door while the, the police were swarming the place. And he walked out the door and into the forest and stayed there for two weeks and then rode a bicycle across the border into Poland. And then made his way to Dubai and then onto the Seychelles. And in the Seychelles, he pretty much did the same thing. He befriended the president of the Seychelles and his son until he tried to kill him with a harpoon gun. Um, and the Seychelles got a bit small for him, so he got onto a boat to Madagascar and then came to South Africa. And he landed here literally with a disguise and a pseudonym of Jules Egbert Savvy. And he was arrested and thrown into prison, into the, the holding cells in Kempton Park. And if you're going to arrest an international fugitive, do not put him in the same jail cell as the best known fixer on the East Rand to the underworld, which is what they did. They put him in a jail cell with George Luca, who then went on to introduce him to Lolly Jackson and Gennagliotti and everyone who's everyone in the underworld. And that's how Krejci started setting up shop here. Um, he, he reached out to Mikey Schultz and Agliotti and Lolly Jackson and started building a network. And, and what Krejci did was he was able to build a reputation as a mobster. So he put up armored glass at the harbor restaurant that he used to sit behind. Um, there were the flashy cars and the big house on Clough Road in Bedford View. And he, he really did um, kind of mold this reputation of being a, an underworld mafia kingpin. And you know, you can't be a kingpin and have a high media profile. You just don't have it both ways. Um, and the story that, the, the catalyst really that blew open who Krejci was and, and placed him firmly in the media spotlight was the Lolly Jackson murder. And, um, you know, we sort of had heard about him, we knew about him, but he didn't have that public notoriety. Um, and that night in, uh, in May 2010, it was a Monday night, rainy night, and I got a phone call from Mikey Schultz to say, because Mikey Schultz, was the best man at Lonnie Jackson's wedding. 
interestingly. And he had phoned me to say, have you heard that Lolly Jackson has been killed? And I said, no. And we couldn't confirm it. And a few hours later, I got another call. Um, and I was watching Grey's Anatomy, and I said to my husband, well, let's just go and have a look, because it wasn't too far away. And we drove around Edleen, and eventually we found this house, and there was nothing going on there. There was one police car parked outside. And I got there, and I thought, geez, we've missed the whole, the whole crime scene. And I didn't realize that we were actually just very, very early. No one had arrived yet. And I looked through the, the security, um, the, the gates, and I saw the smear of blood on the white tiles. And that was the Lolly Jackson murder scene. And then Sean Newman, who was the spokesperson for Teasers, arrived and said to us, is it true that my boss has been killed? And I said, well, you need to confirm it for us so that we can report it. And, and that murder was very much like the Brett Kevill murder, where it, it, it was this catalyst that blew open the underworld. And for years afterwards, we, you know, we still don't know what actually happened. There is this um, dominant narrative that was put out in the days afterwards by Paul O'Sullivan um, that George Luca had shot Lolly Jackson, had phoned Joey Mabasa, the crime intelligence chief in, in Gauteng, had confessed and then fled the country and then popped up in, in Limassol in, in Cyprus. Um, but then George Luca came back to the country and gave this Godfather-esque testimony on his deathbed um, in the Palm Ridge Court uh, with his oxygen nebulizer and this like, you know, gruff, like barely yeah. audible voice explaining how it was Kreutcher who had actually shot Lolly Jackson and called him a cockroach and kicked him um, and then made Luca take the fall. Um, so, to this day, nobody will be prosecuted for that because either the state's main witness or the main suspect is dead because George Luca died. So, we'll never know what happened, but it was that murder that really kind of blew open the, the whole relationship between police and, and organized crime in the country. Why was it though that Radical Kretcher would want Lolly Jackson dead. What kind of business relationship did they have in the first place that uh, would have resulted in animosity between them and one killing the other, if that had been the narrative? Or why would George Luca want to kill Lolly Jackson? It all comes down to money, really, invariably in, in these cases. Um, and there were a couple of different stories around why Kretcher would have wanted Lolly dead. Um, the most dominant one being that they were, they were in this kind of money transfer laundering scheme, which was really like a, a Hawala scheme, where Kreutcher had all of this money offshore that he needed in the country, and Lolly wanted to get all of his money overseas. So they were paying each other off, bypassing the revenue service. Only uh, Kreutcher, as he's wont to do, wasn't actually paying. So Lolly would pay the money, and then Kreutcher would give him a fake uh, proof of payment, basically. Um, and when Lolly found this out, he confronted him, and it ended with Lolly dead. Um, if, if Luca had killed him, also it was uh, on Kreutcher's version came down to money, and that Lolly hadn't paid him as well. Um, so there's also the theory that Kreutcher actually wanted to take over all the teasers. Um, from, from Lonnie Jackson, because he saw it as an opportunity for money laundering. Uh, so he did actually, after uh, Lolly died, put in a massive claim against Lonnie Jackson's estate, which then, of course, also led to a series of other murders um, of Ian Yordan, the attorney who was tying up Lonnie Jackson's estate, and then of Mark Andrews, who was in a big dispute with Lonnie Jackson. So there were a series of other murders that were then triggered by that also. Who would have been perpetrating those murders? Who, who the murderers there? Who the suspects in those cases? Well, well, there's always this tenuous link to Kreutcher, um, and his shadow always looms large over the Ua Gimbala case, over the Ian Yodan case, over Mark Andrews. Um, but there's no definitive proof. Um, so, you know, there's, there's one of two things that happened here. Is that either Kreutcher was calling the shots, and he was behind all of those murders as well, um, but there was never any direct link back to him. Or he was a convenient fall guy. Um, and the cops just couldn't solve the crime, so they just linked it to him because he was this big baddie. Um, and even, you know, as the media, we're responsible for that as well, where if there was any kind of link, be it tenuous to Kreutcher, that would be Kreutcher man in murder, 
you know, that would be the headline. So um, in the book, I do delve into both of the Ian Yodan and Mark Andrews cases, and there is some, some new information about who may have been responsible. I mean, there's this one guy who rocked up at the Prime Media uh, reception one day, just after Ian Yodan had been killed, to say that he was the guy who had gone to Ian Yodan's office to go fetch the laptop. And I had a series of meetings with this guy, and he had these videos, and the whole story is in the book, but it was all kind of scary. Um, and he then went into witness protection and was a, a, a main witness against Kreitcher, um, who was never charged. But then the police believed that he may have actually been the gunman who was responsible. So you just never know with, with these cases. Uh, obviously, Brother Bob Kreitcher is behind bars now. Uh, he's at Coxstat Maximum Security. Uh, that's a, the, the new C-Max. Um, he has phoned Mandy Wiener from his C-Max, from C-Max, which is a little bizarre. You must tell that story. Um, but also, give us a sense, uh, why we're on that theme, of your interaction with Radovan Kreitcher, because you were able to talk to him on occasion in the courtrooms, but he is behind bars and he is facing other charges at the moment, isn't he? So don't feel so safe, because he's actually at Leercorp now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, which is really not that far away. Um, so he's been there for a little while, and in fact I got a phone call from his daughter-in-law today. Um, and they're really concerned about the conditions that he's being kept under. And legitimately so. So, I mean, regardless of, and, and you know how human rights law works in, in the country, is regardless of who it is, you know, they still need to be kept in humane conditions. And they seriously aggrieved at, at the conditions that he's being kept in, and they, they repeatedly go on to court about this. Um, but at the same time, there are so many stories about how he's trying to break out of prison. Um, there are stories of helicopters breaking him out, and armed teams um, breaking through prison walls, and you know, creating murder scenes to distract the cops, and all sorts of stuff. So it's a tough one. Um, you know, the creature is, um, he's a very charismatic guy. And you know, many of the people in this book, you know, they, they, they come across as, as charming and um, incredibly friendly and endearing and you know, they have lots of qualities about them that, that make them who they are, obviously. And, and the thing that, that also makes them quite compelling is that um, they're often regular people like you and me with families and children that they love, um, but they have these alter egos about them. Um, and, and that's how Kreitcher was with me, you know, he'd sit down and every time I saw him in court he would make crack jokes with the media and, you know, he'd always be very humorous. Um, but, you know, I think he's now a shadow of his former self. Um, he, he, he really doesn't have any of the power that he had before. But for a long time while he was in prison he did have massive influence. You know, he, he had ordered assassinations allegedly. And that's one of the trials that's still ongoing, is the alleged assassination, attempted assassination of Paul O'Sullivan that he's facing charges for. Um, he has been convicted and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Um, there has been a decision by the Kenton Park Magistrates Court that he can be extradited. And the Justice Minister must now decide whether or not he can be extradited. Um, but it's a catch-22 because he's clogging up the, the court system because of all of these trials that are running. It costs a fortune to take him to court and back every day because it's a cavalcade of vehicles and literally 40 armored, uh, armed guys in every courtroom. But then if we just let him go and send him back to the Czech Republic and he doesn't face justice here, that also isn't right. Let's just talk about that character, Paul O'Sullivan. By the way, no relation of mine whatsoever, though I often get asked this question. In Ireland, O'Sullivan is like Smith, like Fonamarina, like Lamini. It's a very common name. As I find out, I thought it was an unusual name. Uh, but Paul O'Sullivan, um, who on two occasions when Manny and I have done this uh, Q&A, has been in the audience. On the first occasion, he almost commandeered the, the thing. We couldn't shut him up. Um, but he's an intriguing character. He um, obviously had the Salibi dossier, which um, uh, put it, uh, together a case against the then police commissioner, Jackie Salibi. How... How is that rivalry or that, um, you know, rivalry, I think is the best word, but between uh, Paul O'Sullivan and Radovan Kreitcher played out? 
Look, um, Paul O'Sullivan's a very complicated guy, and, and he plays quite a complicated role in, in the criminal justice system in the country. Um, you know, he, um, by all accounts, um, is this white knight vigilante who's um, styled himself as a, as a cop hunter. I mean, he has brought down national police commissioners. Uh, but there are lots of questions around, around Paul O'Sullivan, and he says that he's self-funded, and he does it just out of the pursuit of justice. But there are lots of questions around who funds him, um, and many of his detractors, rightfully so, have said, you know, where is he getting all the money from? He bought Kreitch's house in Clerf, on Clerf Road, although he denies it, he, he bought it. Um, and that costs several million rand. Um, and, you know, there have been allegations against him. Um, there, there's lots of concern that he is a, a docket killer because he works too closely with the police and he compromises scenes and investigations. And he's at the center of this big fight now between IPED, the police watchdog, and Khobotso uh, Paklani and that, that section of the, of the police. So, so he plays a very important role, I and mean, that's undeniable. Um, but his tactics are sometimes a bit dodge. So, you know, he's not shy to... He sends off these like angry capital lettered emails to people and is very threatening and intimidating, but that's his style and he bullies people, um, but he gets the results. So with Kreacher, I mean, he's so persistent and so dogged that he just went after Kreacher. Um, and it was just after the Salibi trial, while Salibi was actually still on trial, that Kreacher came onto his radar and he realized that this was next level stuff. And he started looking into to Kreitcher and, and he became absolutely central because the police were doing nothing about Kreitcher. They were doing absolutely nothing. They were, because half of them were on his payroll and there was just no political will. So it really was SARS, the rogue unit that was investigating Kreitcher, who ultimately caponed him and brought him down, and Paul O'Sullivan, who was doing any kind of, of work on, on Kreitcher. Um, and there's no way that the, the cops would have been able to, to bring him down if it wasn't for, for Paul O'Sullivan. That's undeniable. And that's why Craig is so angry with him and trying to take him out because he knows that O'Sullivan was driving the, the police investigation into him. Let me pick up on the point you made about these people um, that are, are part of the underworld, that they these nice guys, they've got their families, that they love their children. They also operate in neighborhoods I'm familiar with. I grew up in Edenvale, I went to school in Bedford View, so Kurf Road, I know that road. And I, there's a story, Mandy mentioned the name of Uwe Gambela, who was um, a car, he souped up luxury cars. And he came out to South Africa and he was murdered. Now, I remember the story very well. I remember doing lots of interviews with Mandy on air about this until I read the book, I had no idea. It was actually in a house up the road from where I used to live, in little old Dunvegan Edenvale. It's bizarre that that's the house. I had to go to Google Maps to make sure I know that house. I've worked past that house when I was a schoolboy, going to the early Rosary Convent, for goodness sake. And there was the most brutal of murders that took place. Tell us the story of Uwe Ur Gebele. Who was he and why did he have to die? So um, Uwe Gebele was actually very well known. He had, he had uh, tuned a number of celebrities' cars internationally. So he was kept quite a high profile, but yet, you know, a lot of people don't know the story. It was, it was on the front page of the Saturday Star, but it wasn't really, really that mainstream that, that people remember it. But um, he had kind of been lured to the country. He was going to open a, a dealership here um, for his, his cars. Um, and Jerome Safi, who was one of Kreitcher's lieutenants, had sent him an email and it was thought that, that Kreitcher's money was being used to do this. And Gimbala came to the country, he arrived at the airport, and there's CCTV footage of, of all of this. And people met him there, the guy in a white hat met him, and then he disappeared. And then he phoned his wife, and in English said to her, um, please can you wire a million dollars, I think, to, to this account. Um, and they never heard from him again. And he disappeared, and then about 10 months later, his, um, Somebody did turn state witness in the case and his body was found in a shallow grave near Lotus Gardens in Pretoria. Um, and it turns out that for three or four days he was being held at the snuff house in Dunvegan in Edenville, which is on this quiet residential road that you could have driven past a hundred times and you wouldn't know behind these, these tall fir trees 
Um, and he was held there in, in this house that belonged to Ivan Savov, who was Krejci's CFO, basically. Um, and eventually these hitmen wrapped him in a black bag and duct taped him and sat on him until he died. Um, and just squeezed the oxygen out of him and then buried him. And, and the cops then investigated and the way that they actually managed to, to find the killers was by tracking um, cell phone uh, triangulating and working out who had bought a SIM card and the SIM card had been bought across the road from the Harbour restaurant by an employee of the Harbour restaurant. Uh, and they tracked it all back that way. But then a laptop was recovered from the snuff house that was then stolen from the police station. Because that's what happens. Like this laptop that had all this crucial information about the whole network and the kidnapping was then stolen from the investigating officer's office. Um, so there was all of this kind of backroom stuff that was going on where they were trying to protect, we assume, Preacher. Um, um, but eventually, um, Uwe Gimbali's body was found. And the guys, in another mad twist, you know, these guys went on trial for three or four years, and then after the one was convicted, he escaped and ran out the courtroom because he had paid off um, a police officer and wasn't sentenced. So there's, like, there's all of these different levels of, of corruption that had happened in that case as well. Let's talk about uh, the last few chapters of the book, the last part of the book. You look at the, the turf war between two Cape Town gangsters, Modak and Lufman, and that war, while it might be fought out over there, it is having an impact here, being felt here in Johannesburg as well. And those are two people that you, uh, they agreed to be interviewed as well. But that's another crazy thing about these people. They're supposed to be underworld. Quite happy to talk to somebody who's writing a book. Tell us about those two guys. That's because they don't see themselves as underworld characters. You know, they see themselves as legitimate businessmen, which is why they're quite happy to talk. Um, and, you know, the same way that the Kevill murder and the Lolly Jackson murder had, had been catalysts and, and you know, there were, there were big repercussions from those, the same applied to the Cyril Bierke murder in, in Cape Town in 2011. And that murder of, of Bierke, is, the repercussions of that are being felt today because Bierke's right-hand man was a guy called Nafiz Modak. And Modak is now making a bid for, for power. Um, and last year he kind of rose to prominence and he reunited kind of this, this like old god that was affiliated to Bierke. And he's trying to now take control of all of the, the nightclub security in Cape Town and in Joburg as well from a more established grouping under Mark Lifman and Andre Nordier. Um, and this all came to a head at, a, at an auction in Paro last year, where Modak's properties were going under the hammer, and Lufman was trying to buy them, Modak was having none of it, and there was this big showdown, and guns were pulled, and flip-flops were left behind, and <laughs> it was all very messy. And the net result was Modak was arrested, and there was this long bail application, and in the bail application, we heard all about how Lufman was behind the, the arrest and the investigation, and he was manipulating the cops, and then Modak was released, and then Lufman got arrested by different cops, and he was saying that these cops were Modak's cops who had arrested him. So you've got these two different factions with their own police people um, that are being manipulated against one another. And this is still playing out in Cape Town, and it's far from over, I think. Things have quietened down, but I think it's simmering. Um, they've been sh shouting their mouths off in the media against one another, uh, and I think it's still, it's still going to play out. Away from the actual content of the book, can we talk about writing the book? Um, for how long had you been toying with this idea of writing a book of this nature? And during the writing, did it change, did your focus change as the, the writing process unfolded? You're obviously tapping a lot of the stuff that you've been reporting on in the past. Um, what new uh, elements were you able to bring in that hadn't been in the public domain before? So I've reported on a lot of this over the past uh, decade or so for, for EWN. Um, so I've always wanted to write the book, but I never felt that it was actually safe enough um, because the, it was still kind of playing itself out. Um, and then about two years ago, I started, you know, I thought the time was right and everyone had either been killed or was behind bars. 
Um, and so uh, I started writing it, and it just grew and grew and grew. And it took me a lot longer than it should have, because I just kept doing more and more interviews. And about three or four weeks before we eventually went to print, you know, people were just like, yes, we'll speak, yes, we'll speak. And, you know, it was cramming all of these interviews in, because I just couldn't believe how many people were suddenly willing to talk about it. Um, so the book was actually way too long, and we did a lot of cutting down on it. Um, so there's still a lot of new content that's in there. Um, there's, there's a bit that's on the editing room floor. Um, but, you know, I've tried to give as much behind the scenes detail. You know, a lot of the cases you know about, or you would have heard about them. Like, you'll remember uh, Ian and Don getting killed. Um, you'll remember the Uwe the story. You'll understand the whole Richard and Clearly Dennis breaking that back thing. But you might not understand how it all fits together. And that's what I've tried to, to paint, was that holistic picture of the criminal justice system and how it's been so severely compromised here. That certainly is the, the, the strength of the book, uh, as with Kenny Cabell. Uh, it's pulling it all together and making sense of it all. You can see where everything fits together. There were so many of these characters who I was so familiar with in terms of talking about them on the radio, but didn't realize how they all fitted together. But the, you, you said it was too dangerous, and obviously the climate changed. You are now the book's out, so it wasn't that dangerous now. But was there anything that you felt you had to leave out, either on the legal advice, or because this was something that could put you and your family in real jeopardy? Yeah, I'm sure as hell not going to say it, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there were definitely things that you just you just can't say because, I mean, either you can't prove it legally, um, so, I mean, it hasn't been tested in court, um, or it's defamatory, or um, your, your life could be at risk. Um, so there are certainly things that, that, went, that didn't make into the book. Um, I mean, I do think that a lot of it may come out in court still. Um, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, there, were, there were a few things. It's, <laughs> shall That's remain unsaid. That is exactly the answer I wanted. The fact is that there was stuff that couldn't go into the book, I think is the important point. Um, and, and I believe your husband, Sean Maisel, was your proofreader, is that, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> if I can end where I stood, doesn't read books, doesn't, doesn't read. You haven't read it, have you, Sean? No. Um, let's end where we start before we go to the questions. Uh, Am I justified then, after you have once again reminded me of how bleak it has been with the police service, with crime intelligence, with the way in which the criminal underworld has been able to operate so brashly and so brazenly in South Africa, should I feel confident in any way that a new broom is going to sweep clean? So my biggest fear is that people read the book and um, it's pretty bleak, you know, but I don't want people to read it in despair and think, well, the whole system's broken and I'm packing for Perth. Um, you know, the, the truth of it is that we don't live in this dystopian wasteland where there's no rule of law. There is still rule of law, we still live in a functional democracy, the police are still in control, and I'll never say that we're losing the fight against crime. Uh, we should be very concerned, and I do hope that people read the book and they they realize and they're all, like you're aware of what's actually going on so that the cycle does not repeat itself again. Because when Jackie Sleevey was convicted and we saw how he had been bought by the Kebbles and Agliotti, we should have known them and we should have stopped at them. And what happened was Preacher bought the police on a much bigger level and we're watching it now happen again with Modak and, and Luthman. And we should know that it's, it's civil society that steps in every single time. So with Richard and Clooney, the Freedom Under Law and KSAP went to court to go and stop him from, from acting as a policeman. With Burning and Lameza, when he was appointed head of the Hawks, it was civil society that went to court to challenge um, that decision. Which means that we should be active citizens and we should support these civic rights organizations to ensure that the cycle does not repeat itself again. But I am optimistic, you know, for the first time in nearly a decade, we have a permanent national police commissioner a permanent head of crime intelligence and a permanent head of the Hawks. Uh, Tom Moyani has been moved out at SARS. Arthur Fraser has been moved out at State Security. The only issue I know is Sean Abrahams at the NPA, which is a real bottleneck, unfortunately, but there's a constitutional court decision 
that is pending on that. But I can't imagine he's going to stick around for, for too much longer. So, so yes, I'm optimistic, and you know, I think that they, they are definitely indicators for, for hope. Right, um, we've been going forward 45 minutes, so I think we should uh, see if there are any questions from the floor. Anybody want to ask Mandy a question? Over there, I'll hand Mandy the mic. trust but I also am quite careful about not being one-sided in my reporting of, of him or anybody else um, I always try and give a, a balanced perspective I mean, there's no such thing as of being an objective journalist you know it's, it's a myth and when I was younger I used to think that it was a reality but it's not actually possible we all have our own lived experiences and, and, and inherent biases but you know I try and you know, now even when I speak about creature I try and speak about the, the, the evidence that's there but also his version of events. And that's what I've tried to do in the book as well, is try and give everyone's version of events and try and give people a, a platform. Um, this upsets a lot of people. Uh, Paul O'Sullivan once phoned into 702 to call me the head of the Radovan Creature fan club, <laughs> um, which I took great um, offense to. Um, because, you know, it's not that I'm particularly um, non-critical of him um, but I do get his version of events I interview him and some people think that I shouldn't be interviewing them but I at least think that if you go out and, and do an interview with Mark Liffman and Nafez Modak at least you understand what you're dealing with and you get a lot more information that way and a much better understanding of what's going on than if you just let it carry on simmering in the underworld then you're just oblivious to it all. Any other questions over there? So I was actually on a, on a panel with, uh, with Jacques recently uh, where we discussed exactly this issue about uh, what journalists place at risk. And, and, and we were saying, both of us were saying that it's a very uncomfortable topic for us to discuss um, because we don't actually the ones who are, are at risk. It's the whistleblowers, it's the police officers, it's the prosecutors. It's not necessarily the journalists that they're going to come for. Um, you know, and also, the, the, there may have been threats, but anybody who sends me, or Jacques, as he says, an SMS that's badly typed and horribly spelt, um, those are not the people that are going to kill you. They're not going to send you a big warning and say, I'm coming for you. It's the, the people that you don't see coming. Um, and, and we're very fortunate that we live in a country where we have freedom of speech, and journalists are protected, and journalists don't really get killed here, um, fortunately. I mean, there have been some, some incidents and you know, it's not even the people like Jacques or I that, that you should worry about. It's just look what's going on in KZN with councillors, where people are getting um, getting killed left, right, and centre, and there's no one's even batting an eyelid at it. Um, so for us, you know, we feel quite uncomfortable speaking about about threats on our life because it's really um, the the cops who are going after these guys, the prosecutors, the whistleblowers who are brave enough, who the people who turn state witness, uh, who are facing the the real threats. Yeah, sorry. I was lucky enough to be in a session last week with was addressed by advocate Kerry Nell. And somebody in the audience said more or less what we're saying here. How do you keep the pressure on the government to produce things? And he said it's civic society. If you continuously complain on radio, come through on 702, come through on the FM, complain about it, talk about it, raise the issue all the time, the government cannot ignore it. You can't let it die and fall under the carpet. Is that more or less what you're saying? 100% true. So that's it, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people like to complain. And, you know, there's no point in complaining into an echo chamber. And I always say, if you're going to complain, then go. 
Um, but if you're going to stay here, then fight for it. So it means writing letters to your newspaper. It means phoning into radio stations, phone your councillor. If you have um, a, a certain expertise, if you're an actuary or a lawyer or whatever, give those, those services to civic rights organisations. Because that's the only way we apply pressure. Um, and, and if you look at what the Helen Sussman Foundation has done, if you look at the black sash on um, the social grants issue that has gone to court, um, if you look at equal education, if you look at uh, the Right to Know campaign, um, all of these organisations have stepped into the breach where there's been this, this void of leadership. Um, and you, you have to have active citizens, otherwise there's no way that we're going to hold people to account. Um, give money to Amu Bungani or to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> buy your yeah. book! Yeah, buy my book! Yes. Um, but yeah, give, give, uh, give money to, to investigative journalists so that they can... I mean, the Gupta leaks was absolutely pivotal to getting rid of Jacob Zuma. Um, and you need to fund Amu Bungani and um, Daily Maverick because that's the only way that, that you get anywhere. So uh, my colleague Peter Louis Marburg has written a great book on, on the Guptas, so I'm not going anywhere near them. Um, yeah, and, and I feel I'm, I'm curious about the backstory to, to the Gupta League, so that I think is quite interesting. Um, and the whistleblower is there, I and mean, that's something that I'd you know that I'm fascinated by. Um, yeah, look, I think that I mean you spoke about ISIS and all of that, it all comes down to intelligence again. Um, and I've always flagged this, you know, with the Tulsi twins and what's happened at the mosque in, in KZN. It's all intelligence, you know, and, and that is our intelligence structures that have been compromised. And if we don't have those intelligence structures, then there's no way we're going to see it coming. Question over there. So we're talking about uh, state capture and, and what you've uncovered in the last decade. Do you think, in your opinion, is it because we're such a young democracy? Is it something that we will outgrow that we eventually have these? Oh, that's it's such a complex question because you know the, the corruption that we're seeing is not unique to South Africa. Um, you know, if you look at like Kreitcher, for example, and his capture of, of the police, I mean, it happens everywhere. It, you know, it happens in the states. It happens as, as all this time. The relationship between organised crime and, and the police. Um, so, so in that sense, it's not unique to South Africa. But I do think that, that we have lots of legacy issues and there, there were lots of opportunities. I mean, if you, if you just look at the way that Sheikh was able to corrupt Zuma um, and Agliotti was able to corrupt Sidibi, <coughs> those were all relationships born at the turn of democracy, where you had people returning from exile and people like Sheikh and Agliotti stepping into the breach there, uh, offering to pay for their children's doctor's bills and education. Um, and that was because of, of the transition. Um, and those relationships were, were built from there. Um, the same with the Guptas, where they came in and were able to step in where, where Sheikh had, had fallen away. Um, so some of those are unique to South Africa. I have no idea going forward. You know, I do think that we're probably a lot more aware than we ever were in, in the past about this. So hopefully, you know, if we remain vigilant, it won't be as much of a problem, but you just, you never know, really. Unfortunately. Okay, I have to ask author type questions. <laughs> um, this is your fourth book. Yeah. Okay, so if you compare the writing of your first book to the writing of your fourth book, um, how have you learnt about the writing process and what is the difference between journalistic writing and writing a book? Um, so, so a lot of people um, <coughs> remark about how my, my books are I kind of written like, like fiction. You know, I always say that truth is stranger than fiction in this country. Um, and it is that kind of Truman Capote in cold blood style. Um, and, and that's what makes it readable, I hope. I do think that you know, this book is, is kind of a, a sequel to Killian Kebble. 
Um, but at the same time, it's a much more mature, grown-up book because I've grown up a little bit. Um, I, I wrote Killing Kevil in my 20s. I'd never written anything except a magazine article before that, and I thought I was bulletproof. So I wrote it in three months, and it dropped, and it was this kind of publishing phenomenon. Uh, and now I'm a lot more circumspect and a lot more considered. And then, you know, I read this book a dozen times before it went to the printer. Where's Kenny Kevoir? Just put it out there and hope for the best. And I was bloody lucky. Um, whereas this time I'm definitely, I've been more, um, just, you know, done more checks and balances and, and I think been a better journalist about it. I mean, I suppose that comes with, with being a little bit more grown up. Well, I think we're going to have to bring the, the guillotine down. And 55, we've never done 55 minutes. That's our record. Um, and also, I have to go to bed. If I go to bed right now, I'm going to get eight hours sleep. Uh, so um, that's the reason. Unless you want to carry on talking to Mandy. I'm sure Mandy will be signing books, uh, I'd imagine. Uh, if you've got some money left over, because you are going to buy Mandy's book, and if you've got a bit of bucks left over, buy Annalisa Burgess's book, Heist which is a very important book, and it feeds off very nicely from, from Mandy's book. But thank you very much. I've enjoyed, uh, I hope, entertaining you. Yes. Good night.